In the world of AMD 800 series chipset motherboards, to date KitGuru has reviewed three boards, each of which has the X870E chipset. We've looked at a very expensive ASUS, a fairly expensive MSI, and a decent value gigabyte. And today we have this MSI MAG X870 Tomahawk Wi-Fi. So it's X870 rather than X870E, priced at £265 here in the UK, and it has absolutely zero RGB lighting. Let's start by checking out the aesthetic of the X870 Tomahawk, which I like. But that's not enough for MSI. Let's take a look at how they describe this motherboard. They tell us it features a distinctive black and military green colour scheme embodying its robust and rugged identity. I'm not actually sure I'd say that that is green. To me it looks more like a kind of a yellow. Black yellowish greenish day glow i like it moving on what other features do we have the pcb is eight layer the vrms are 14 by 80 amps we've got usb 4 which is ubiquitous on x870 and x870e there's support for pci express gen 5 and you won't be surprised to see there's also supplemental pci express power there's an emphasis on cooling, both up at the VRMs and also on the M.2s where we have M.2 shield frozer heat sinks. The motherboard supports ATX 3.1, so it's ready for the latest and indeed the next gen graphics cards. And MSI tells us the board is set up to deliver a huge amount of power as required to your components, both in terms of the main 24 pin ATX, the supplemental PCI Express power and also to all your fans and your RGB. We also have DIY friendly features. In practice what that means is this, off with this primary M.2 heatsink and that one there. However this heatsink is screwed down. When it comes to your graphics card you install the graphics card in the usual way but to release it you press that button. You don't have to fiddle on those latches that involves a screwdriver being jammed in there. In other words they're making life easier for the home PC builder but you do still require a screwdriver. Let's take a look at the accessories you get in the package before we take a closer look at the features. So we'll start with the antenna for the Wi-Fi 7. Got some packaging at the business end. There we go. And to connect it, even though the uh, terminals here have a male thread, there is no nut on the antennae. And they simply plug in. SATA cables and RGB cables. That is a dongle so you can connect up your case front panel connections and then this plugs down there. USB flash drive with drivers to get your motherboard up and running. And then we have various bits and pieces to do with SSD installation. They have a hex on them and that is a driver. Overall you get a decent number of accessories, certainly everything you require, and when you consider the low price of the X870 Tomahawk Wi-Fi it seems entirely appropriate. If you're looking for a new chair then definitely go and check out boolies.co.uk. They offer a whole host of gaming and office chairs that come in a variety of different finishes and different colours. Okay, let's go around the features. The main expansion slot is PCI Express Gen 5 by 16 and is powered by the CPU. The other two slots, one is Gen 3 by 1 from the chipset and the Gen 4 by 4, also from the chipset, is shared with one of the M.2s. The M.2s, we have two Gen 5 by 4s, one Gen 4 by 4 and one Gen 4 by 2 which is shared with that Gen 4 slot. We also have four SATA 6 gigabit per second. The VRMs are a 14 plus 2 plus 1 by 80 amps Smart Power Stages or SPS and those use doublers. And on the rear I.O. panel, we have two USB 4s rated at 40 gigabits per second. Those are obviously type C. We have a USB type C rated at 10 gigabits per second. We have an internal header for a USB 20 gigabit per second type C. 
On the rear I.O. we have two USB Type A's which are 10 gigabits per second, three USB Type A's rated at 5 gigabits per second, headers for four more USB Type A 5 gigabit. We also have headers for four USB 2's and on the rear I.O. we have ports for four USB 2's. The Ethernet is Realtek 5 gigabit. We have Wi-Fi 7 and Bluetooth 4 and the 7.1 channel audio is by Realtek. The layout of the board is very clean, but it includes a good number of features. For example, PWM fan headers, three up the top in the CPU area, two at the side, so essentially five grouped together, and then we have two at the foot of the board and another one over here next to the PCI Express Extra Power. Support for DDR5 as mentioned, we have a debug display, laid down SATA next to the laid down USB-C, and laid down USB 3 type A. Buttons I have not mentioned on the rear I.O. we have micro buttons for clearing the CMOS and also for BIOS flashback. Those are both very useful. We do not, however, have micro buttons for either power or for reset. I consider that to be a minor shame, but it's certainly not a problem. Overall, no apparent problems. Everything looks to be in the right place. For our test system, the processor, AMD Ryzen 7 9800X 3D, already installed in the socket. SSD is a crucial T700, which is PCI Express Gen 5. Let's just snap on the heatsink. Memory, we have 32 gigabytes of G-Skill Trident Z5 Neo, so that has an AMD Expo profile, rated at DDR5 6000. Let's turn that round so we can get a little bit of a view of that. Nicely understated, and it fits the aesthetic of the motherboard very neatly. Our power supply, Seasonic Focus GX1000. It's gold rated and it's ATX 3.1. It's the latest version of the Focus for 2024. This copper shim is a deep cool paste guard. It's just to keep the processor tidy. Put that on there. And then we apply some Arctic MX4 thermal compound. And we're ready for our CPU cooler, which is a Fantex Glacier 1, and that's a D30 model, so the fans are 30mm thick rather than the usual 25mm. We connect the pump, and we connect the fans just the one connection because the three fans are daisy chained together. And the final piece of the hardware is this graphics card, which is an MSI RTX 4090 Ventus 3X 24 gigabyte. And we want some power for the graphics card. And now we have the PC running, we can take a look around the BIOS of the Tomahawk. The setup screen has the same look and feel as the BIOS that we saw on the Carbon Wi-Fi that we reviewed a few weeks ago. We like this new approach by MSI. The thing is, although there are many options to do with overclocking and such like, we don't need to worry about any of those. All we need to do is enable Expo, have a quick look at the fan curve, and then we can head into Windows. The fun thing here is that when I installed MSI Center, I went into default mode and also installed Mystic Lite, which is MSI's RGB control software. This motherboard doesn't have any RGB. Even the RAM from G-Skill doesn't have any RGB. So look, absolutely no setup required whatsoever. And doesn't that just make a pleasant change? As a world leading manufacturer, CyberPower PC UK expertly builds each PC with the largest range of parts available in the UK. We handle all your packages with care and ship them directly to you on next day delivery. Visit cyberpowersystem.co.uk. In our performance charts, you'll see four blue bands. These all apply to Ryzen 7 9800X 3D on three different motherboards. In this Geekbench 6 multi-core chart at the top, we have the Carbon Wi-Fi running overclocked. Following that, we have the Asus ROG Crosshair running on auto. Then we have the Mag Tomahawk running on auto. And bottom of the four, we have the MSI Carbon Wi-Fi on auto. You can see there is some separation, but there's not much to choose between the four. Geekbench 6 single core, the bars spread out. So bottom of the four, we have the Tomahawk running on auto. Two points ahead of that, 
i.e. a tie. We have the Crosshair Hero on auto and it's a small step up to the Carbon Wi-Fi on auto. Overclocking the Carbon Wi-Fi does make a difference, however it's a small difference. And it's a similar story in Cinebench R23 Multicore. Top of the four we have the Carbon Wi-Fi overclocked, 500 points below that, i.e. a small percentage, we have the Tomahawk running on auto, and then it's pretty much a tie between the ROG Crosshair Hero on auto and the Carbon Wi-Fi on auto. CPU power consumption. This is interesting. We have the Mag Tomahawk running the processor at 110 watts, 5.2 gigahertz all core. The Carbon Wi-Fi on auto, 120 watts for the same clock speed. Then we have the ROG Crosshair Hero, 126 watts. And when you overclock, you move up to 141 watts. 3D Mark CPU profile. There's very little to choose between the motherboards here. The carbon Wi Fi overclocked wins out by a small head, and then the three boards on auto is essentially a tie. 3D Mark Time Spy. We're bringing our RTX 4090 graphics card into the mix, and the graphics card plays a huge part in this test. The Tomahawk on auto and the carbon Wi Fi on auto are essentially tied. It's a small step up to the ROG Crosshair Hero on auto which curiously delivers the same results as the carbon Wi-Fi overclocked. The takeaway here is the motherboard doesn't really make much difference. This is all about graphics. Gaming, Far Cry 6 at 1080p on Ultra preset. Here we can see the Ryzen 7 9800X 3D in all its glory. And there's quite a spread between the frame rates. Top of the chart, we have the carbon Wi-Fi overclocked, followed by the carbon Wi-Fi on auto. Behind that, it's the ROG Crosshair Hero on auto. And quite a step down from that, we have the Tomahawk on auto. Our second game is Avatar Frontiers of Pandora, also at 1080p using the Ultra preset. Top of the chart, we have the ROG Crosshair on auto, followed by the Tomahawk on auto. Then we have a step down to the Carbon Wi-Fi on auto. And behind that, we have the Carbon Wi-Fi overclocked. The thing to note there is while the Carbon Wi-Fi overclocked has a lower average frame rate, which is strange to see, the 1% low is significantly higher. Assassin's Creed Mirage at 1080p on ultra high preset. Top of the chart, your Zeus ROG Crosshair, followed by the Carbon Wi-Fi on auto, pretty much in a tie with the Carbon Wi-Fi overclocked. A very short head behind that, we see the Tomahawk on auto. Cyberpunk 2077. Once again, top of the chart, it's the Zeus ROG Crosshair, and then we see the Tomahawk running on auto. The Carbon Wi-Fi overclocked, followed by the Carbon Wi-Fi on auto in third and fourth positions. And our final game is Total War Pharaoh, 1080p Ultra Preset. Top of the chart is the Carbon Wi-Fi Overclocked, followed by the Azus ROG Crosshair Hero. The Carbon Wi-Fi on Auto in third place, and just behind those we see the Tomahawk running on Auto. In conclusion, I like this MSI Mag X870 Tomahawk, and am unable to find a significant difference between X870e and X870 chipsets. So that's something cleared up and for the better. Pros and cons, the good points. Impressive value for money. Sadly, you have to recalibrate your brain and think of 300 pounds as a going rate for a motherboard these days. But in that context, this is decent value. You have good DIY features for installing PCI Express graphics card and M.2 uh, SSDs. Well, two of the four of them at any rate. You've got five gigabit ethernet and Wi-Fi 7, so connectivity is good and the VRM is plenty strong enough for a Zen 4 or Zen 5 processor. This processor's drawing, as I showed you, just over 100 watts, and these days 200 watts is, is all you require for any Ryzen processor that I can think of off the top of my head. VRM, absolutely great. Cons, the negative points. The fourth M.2 is essentially for show, so ignore that. Think of this as a three M.2 uh, motherboard and I would have preferred to see a power micro button as one of the features, but presumably that would have bumped up the cost by some tiny amount of money. Overall, you're basically buying this motherboard for the aesthetic because it is indeed different to the eye. We've seen all of these features in different permutations. There's no problems with the motherboard. It's a decent piece of hardware. It's worth buying. Remember, we're on TikTok and head over to kitguru.net to read our news and reviews.